missions over Antarctica, astrophysics with instruments 1,000 or 125,000 feet above the ground with Dr. Martin Israel. For those of you who are not familiar with the Academy, I'd just like to take a moment to tell you a bit about who we are. The Academy is an independent or science organization supported entirely through community contributions. At venues throughout the region, we connect science in the community through free and or very low cost public talks, science seminars and workshops, and trips and tours that feature science scientists and engineering professionals of both national and international renown. In addition to the advancing of public science, understanding of science, it is our mission to inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. So we offer a number of free and low cost opportunities, especially to teens, such as our Teen Science Cafes, Teen Science Youth Leadership Council, and Junior Academy of Science. The Junior Academy is a professional STEM membership organization for students from all ranges of academic backgrounds in grades 6 through 12 that offer hands-on opportunities in science, engineering, and medicine. Teens can attend unique behind-the-scenes explorations of leading engineering technology and science labs of our region, access university libraries, participate in field opportunities, and challenging and engaging science competitions and junior academy members make real world connections, meaning top STEM professionals. You can find more information on the junior academy and all of our community wide science events and programs by visiting our website at www.academyofsciencestl.org. Or you may also visit us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Or before you leave tonight, please pick up some of our literature that is on the table just outside of the auditorium. I do want to take the time out to mention a couple of upcoming um, Academy events that you might have an interest in attending. On Thursday evening, February 18th, here in the Living World Auditorium, Auditorium at 7.30 p.m., and as a part of our Conservation Conversation Series in partnership with the St. Louis Zoo, Dr. Greg Rasmussen, founder of the Painted Dog Research Trust and Painted Dog Conservation in Zimbabwe, will be here to talk about protecting painted dog populations and building a complete future for wildlife conservation in Zimbabwe. This event is free and open to the public, and if you do not need uh, to register to attend. And on Saturday, February 27th, from 11 to 3 p.m., in partnership with BeeSpeaksSTL.com, one of the world's most renowned honeybee behavioralists and recipient of the Alexander von Humboldt Distinguished U.S. Science Scientist Prize and his work for uh, field of biology, Cornell University professor Dr. Thomas Seeley will be in St. Louis at the Missouri Botanical Gardens Schoenberg Auditorium for a series of Saturday lectures. Lessons from the Hive, Following Wild Bees, and Book Signing. Dr. Seeley is the author of Honeybee Democracy and the soon to be released Following the Wild Bees, The Craft and Science of Bee Hunting. And there is a modest fee of $22 to attend and $28 at the door for this series of uh, Saturday talks on one of the Earth's most important pollinators by one of the world's foremost animal behaviorists, Dr. Thomas Seeley. And you can also find more information about that event on our website. If you would like to receive e-notification of upcoming events, public lectures, and events, there are some e-news sign-up sheets that will make their way around the audience. If you are a student and you need to verify your attendance at tonight's talk, we will have verification cards available following the Q&A out of the table outside of the auditorium. Just as a reminder, please turn off all of your cell phone ringers or any other electronic devices that make noise during the program. And with all of that said, I'd like to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Dr. Martin Israel. Dr. Israel earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago and his PhD from the California Institute of Technology. He is currently a professor of physics with the Department of Physics and the McDonald Center of the Space Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis, where he also served as Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences from 1987 to 1994, and as Vice Chancellor from 94 to 97. Dr. Israel has been involved in some of the world's successful studies of the composition of galactic cosmic rays, and he has extensive experience with balloon and satellite-borne instrumentation for cosmic array astrophysics. Having developed, among, along with his colleagues, innovative instruments that have been sent aloft in spacecraft and on high altitude, altitude balloons to measure the composition and energy of heavy cosmic rays. 
He was principal investigator with the heavy, heavy nuclei experiment, which successfully flew on the HGAO-3 spacecraft in 1979 to 81, measuring abundances of rare cosmic ray elements with atomic number Z greater than 26, extending up to the rarest actinide elements. Dr. Israel is a fellow of both the American Physical Society and the Academy of Sciences St. Louis. He is former Alfred P. Sloan Fellow and recipient of the NASA Exceptional Science Scientific Achievement Award. And he is here with us tonight to talk about astrophysics in Antarctica using stratospheric balloons. On behalf of the Academy of Science of St. Louis and the St. Louis Zoo, won't you please join me in welcoming Dr. Martin Israel. That's fine. I don't think I probably don't. Need it. Well, good evening, and uh, my thanks to the academy and to the zoo. Uh, the academy, about four months ago, called me up and said we'd like to hear a talk from you about ballooning over Antarctica and your a couple of the experiments you've been involved in there. Uh, I think maybe everybody came out here because. On a night like tonight, where we've got spring weather in February, you want to be reminded what snow and cold might look like. And so we'll see a little bit of that over Antarctica. <laughs> Maybe you're glad you aren't seeing it, but anyhow. Uh, so I'm talking about astrophysics from 125,000 feet above the ground, some 24 miles or so up. That's an altitude where 99.6% uh, of the Earth's atmosphere is below us. So we've got less than a half of 1% of the atmosphere left between us and space. And it's about as close to outer space as we can get without rockets and other expensive uh, devices. So that's where we are. Roughly what I want to talk about is two investigations which are part of what we call high energy astrophysics. Most people think of astronomy as looking through a telescope with their eyes or with some sort of photographic device at visible light. And it's true that that's an important part of astrophysics, but there's a lot of information about the gal our galaxy, about other stars, our galaxy, and the universe at large that comes from other wavelengths and other messengers, and I'm talking about two of those here, cosmic rays, which we study with our super tiger instrument, and neutrinos, which we look for with ANITA. And so I'll talk about those two investigations. I'll talk about what are cosmic rays and what we've learned about cosmic rays from this super tiger instrument. I'll even tell you what tiger stands for. and. Uh, We'll talk a little bit about why we bother going to Antarctica to do this kind of research. Uh, and uh, then I will talk finally about the ANITA experiment and how one goes about searching for extremely high energy neutrinos. So I want to start by just giving some credit where credit is due. I'm talking about two experiments that I've been much involved in, but these are definitely not just my experiments. These are all things that involve a major amount of collaboration, a number of people working here at Washington U and at other institutions. And uh, this is just a kind of a quick overview. Uh, up in the upper left corner is a group of people from Washington University here. Uh, the principal investigator for the Tiger instrument, oh, let's see, I guess I don't have a pointer, that's all right. Uh, is uh, my colleague Bob Binns, who's sort of halfway up on the left side uh, of that pile. I'm down in front on the right, along with some of our graduate students and technical staff and uh, uh, other faculty. Uh, we work with people at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, at Caltech, uh, at the University of Minnesota. So the TIGER is a uh, a really a, a, an important collaboration. None of these groups could have done this experiment by themselves. And by the way, Super Tiger is the evolution of an earlier instrument, Tiger, which was aimed at cosmic rays heavier than iron, 
and some one of the collaborators, and I'm not sure who, came up with the name Tiger. It's, as it says up here in the upper right, the Trans Iron Galactic Element Recorder. It's a bit of a stretch, but uh, that's what it is. Uh, it is looking at elements heavier than iron from coming from elsewhere in the galaxy. The other experiment that I will be talking about is ANITA. People like these clever acronyms. ANITA is the Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna. And it is an experiment which we'll talk about uh, later on in this talk, which uh, is looking for <clears throat> high energy neutrinos by looking at pulses of radio emission coming out of the Antarctic ice. And it's a collaboration with a lot of institutions. The principal investigator of this is Peter Gorham at the University of Hawaii, the top institution. And there's a lot of institutions of which Washington U plays one key role. But again, it's an experiment where no one of these places by themselves could do it. It takes a lot of uh, cooperating scientists. So uh, let's talk about cosmic rays and ballooning. Ballooning goes way back with cosmic rays. Cosmic rays were first discovered. Uh, this is a picture, it's not very clear. Victor Hess was a scientist in Austria who made seven balloon flights up to altitudes as high as 16,000 feet. Uh, there he is in one of his baskets with an instrument to measure background radiation. The point is people had seen, had recognized, thank you very much. Thank you. People had recognized that uh, there was background radiation and in fact you have secondary cosmic rays going through you right now. Don't worry, it's not because you're here in a cosmic ray lecture. There have been these things going through you as long as you've been on the surface of the Earth. And uh, they are, we will talk about them, the result of cosmic rays hitting the upper atmosphere. The key thing was there was this background radiation. People assumed it was maybe radioactivity from the ground, except Victor Hess took a radiation detector up in the balloon several times and found that there was more radiation intensity the higher he went, which certainly suggests it's not radiation coming from the ground, but coming from above, from the cosmos, thus cosmic rays. Uh, and uh, the next big advance in studying cosmic rays came from Arthur Compton, who uh, did his Nobel Prize winning work here at Washington University in the 1920s. Then he went to the University of Chicago and then in the mid-40s came back here as Chancellor of Washington U. And this is just a piece of a paper he published in 1933. And the key statement here is that he saw a variation of the intensity of this radiation with latitude. And that indicated that cosmic rays are charged particles, not rays in the usual sense of X-rays or gamma rays or, or light rays, but they're charged particles. And the reason, the evidence for that came from this. This is a picture of the Earth, and the lines, the red lines there are the Earth's magnetic field lines. Uh, and the key thing is when a charged particle comes in toward the equator, it's got to cut across these magnetic field lines that are the result of currents in the core of the Earth. And when the charged particle cuts across the magnetic field lines, it gets deflected. And only the highest energy cosmic rays, charged particles, can get in near the equator. And the closer you get to a pole, the more the, the lower energy cosmic rays are allowed in. And if you get near the pole, Coming toward the pole, you're kind of traveling along these field lines, not across them, and the cosmic rays aren't deflected at all. So the fact that Compton saw the cosmic ray flux varying with latitude uh, indicated that they were charged particles because 
none of these rays, X-rays, gamma rays, light rays, are deflected by, cos by magnetic field. Um, uh, this is a picture of Compton in the field with his instrument along with uh, Victor Hess uh, admiring Compton's apparatus. Um, this is, I, I just have to show you the fun of being a cosmic ray physicist. This is a paper by Compton co-authored by somebody from a steamship company. Why is that? It's because he spent a good part of a year traveling on a ship from Vancouver, British Columbia to Sydney, New South Wales, and observing how the cosmic ray intensity varied as he traveled. And uh, this is a graph of latitude versus intensity. And what you see is near Vancouver or near Sydney, the intensity is relatively high because you're closer to the magnetic pole. And as you got near the equator, the intensity dropped by about 10%. So this was really the, the, the final proof that cosmic rays, this radiation coming at the Earth from outer space someplace, are charged particles, not rays. The name rays has stuck. So we still talk about cosmic rays even though they are particles. So what we now know is that cosmic rays at the top of the atmosphere are mostly bare atomic nuclei, and a few percent of them are electrons. Uh, so, and they're atomic nuclei from the entire periodic table. And the relative abundance of them is similar to the abundance of elements on Earth or in the sun, uh, although there are some notable differences. So the most common is hydrogen, uh, by the way, this table, the vertical scale is a logarithmic scale. Every big tick mark represents a factor of 10. So it's mostly hydrogen, about 90% hydrogen. It's only about 10% helium. And all the heavier elements are 1 or 2% uh, of, of the total. And so what we are seeing, what the radiation that Hess saw at 16,000 feet and what Compton measured at sea level are mostly short-lived secondary particles, muons, that are produced when these primary nuclei hit an atmospheric nucleus and kind of go splat or make a nuclear interaction and all sorts of secondary stuff comes out. And some of that secondary stuff are muons that live for a couple of microseconds, but they can get down here to sea level, many of them. And that's what's going through you right now is mostly cosmic ray secondary muons. Um, now, the whole, you know, the basic question is where are these things coming from? And the problem with charged particles, we've already seen that the Earth's magnetic field can deflect them. Well, there's magnetic fields in all sorts of directions in interstellar space. And so that means cosmic rays, wherever they come from, can be deflected on the way here. In fact, by the time they get near Earth, they are essentially isotropic, the same intensity everywhere. And you can't learn anything about where they come from by seeing where this particular cosmic ray came. Here comes a cosmic ray coming this way. That does not mean that back there is the source where they came from, because it could have come from over there and been deflected as it wandered through the galaxy because of all these magnetic fields. So unlike light, if we see light coming from a bright spot there, well, that's the star it came from, or X-rays or gamma rays. But the cosmic rays, these charged particles, the only way we can get clues about their sources, or the main way, is by looking at the composition, what, which elements are there in which relative abundances, and, and uh, what source could account for those kind of abundances. So I've got this plot here again that shows the cosmic ray, the relative abundances of various elements in the cosmic rays. 
And again, because this is a logarithmic plot, there's a tremendous variation. Hydrogen, element one, up in the upper left, uh, the flux of those at the top of the atmosphere is roughly one per square centimeter per second. Square centimeter is about the size of your thumbnail, and there's at the top of the atmosphere, by the way, the balloons that I'm talking about at the top of the atmosphere are unmanned balloons. We're not following Hess's view. Hess went to 16,000 feet. You're not putting me up at 125,000 feet. Uh, but at that altitude, hydrogen nuclei of the cosmic rays are about one per square centimeter per second. You get to heavier elements like iron, silicon or iron, and you're talking about roughly one per square meter per second, a square meter, square yard, roughly. And those lower elements have been pretty well map mapped out by now. But what we're working on with the Tiger instrument and the Super Tiger instrument are these rare things uh, that are much heavier than uh, that are heavier than iron, where the flux is roughly one per square meter per day. And so if you want to get a picture of what the relative abundances are, you need several square meters up above the atmosphere for several days. You've got to get above the atmosphere because they break up on the way into the atmosphere. And you need a large detector for a long time if you really want to get a good picture of what the abundances are. And the, abundant, the relative abundances of these things uh, is information about where they're coming from. So I'll tell you a little bit about the Super Tiger instrument. It's actually, uh, there's a picture of it down in the lower right is the actual instrument. There's a schematic, and I'm not going to go through the details of the detector system, but it contains several layers, and I'll show you pictures of some of the layers. <coughs> Excuse me. There are several uh, detectors, the scintillators and the Cherenkov counters and, uh, that measure the charge of the particle, and then there are detectors that uh, measure the trajectory. Where did it enter and where did it leave so we know what angle it came through? Uh, and that's a picture. The, the schematic is about of one quarter of the total instrument. The total instrument has two modules uh, and uh, each one half of each module is roughly a little more than a square meter. Uh, just to give you a sense, this is one of the, again, one quarter of the whole thing, uh, one of the scintillator layers. A scintillator is a transparent plastic that has a particular dye in the plastic. When a charged particle goes through, it excites the dye, and a little flash of light comes out. And that light is piped to some photomultiplier tubes in the corners, which uh, see the pulse of light and produce an electronic pulse that we can record. And the size of that pulse tells us something about the charge of the particle, which nucleus it is, and how fast, it and how fast it's going. Uh, then there are these Cherenkov detectors, which are another kind of plastic. Again, a big square piece of plastic in an almost empty box with all these big holes in it. You see uh, Ryan Murphy, who was a graduate student in our group, who recently completed his PhD, uh, working with, uh, you can't see the piece of plastic down there very well, but it's down there. And each one of those holes has one of these photomultiplier tubes looking in the hole. And again, it's a case, charged particle goes through, it gives off a flash of light. The intensity of the light depends on what charge the particle has and how fast it's going. But it's a different dependence on its velocity than the scintillator. And so with both measurements, we can untangle both the charge and the velocity. Um, and then, but we also have to know just which direction the particles are going, because you have this big flat slab, 
A particle going straight through will give a smaller signal than a particle going through along a larger trajectory. And so we have to know the trajectory the particle is going through. And for that, we have thin strips of scintillating material uh, and basically which strip, and we have a crossed layers near the top and crossed layers near the bottom, so which of the strips going this way and that way gets a bright flash of light, tells us where the particle was on top, and a similar crossed uh, hodoscope at the bottom tells us the direction. So those are then put together, and you see again, you see some thin layers at the top and bottom, which are the uh, uh, scintillators and the hodoscope with the, the thin strips. You see some of the photomultipliers looking into the two big empty, almost empty boxes, which are looking at the Cherenkov radiation. And you see two modules there. Uh, each one of them, as I say, is a little more than a meter across and a little more than two meters long. Uh, and that, so those two pieces together uh, form our super tiger. The earlier experiment that we had done, which was tiger, uh, is a little smaller than one quarter of it, a little smaller than half of one of these two big pieces. So here we are down in Antarctica. I say we, in all fairness, I have to be honest, Almost everyone in my research group has been to Antarctica, but for various reasons I have not. So I'm, so the pictures down, the pictures down, from down there, I have to admit, I didn't take any of those pictures, although I've been in close communication with everybody down there. So uh, there's the substructure. You see this white substructure with the two modules on top of it, uh, uh, assembled in, one, in the hangar down in uh, near Williams Field, which is near McMurdo, uh, Antarctica, which is, uh, uh, McMurdo is uh, roughly due south of Christchurch, New Zealand. You get there by flying commercially to Christchurch, New Zealand, which is a total of perhaps 20 hours in the air, and then five or six hours on a military transport sitting in a hammock on a milita noisy military transport from there to McMurdo. So here's the tiger getting ready to launch. So you see up near the top, the shiny box at the top, that's where the two modules of the uh, ti uh, Super Tiger instrument are. What you're looking at is the outside of the thermal insulation, which is styrofoam covered with aluminized mylar to reflect the sunlight because the sun is on it all the time, and the sun uh, could heat things up inordinately if we didn't do a proper job of insulating. Down at the bottom, these uh, black squares. Those, those, are, those are the uh, 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 solar cells. The elect the, the, all the instrument inside there is running on elect it's, it's an electronic instrument, and we need electricity, we need power, and those are solar cells for generating the power that we need. Uh, so it's hanging on the front of a truck. You get a sense of the scale when you see these people down in the lower right corner. Uh, it's, it's a pretty big object, although it's going to appear small in a minute because now I'm going to show you what's involved in a balloon launch. So we'll start out on the bottom here. I'm not supposed to leave this microphone. but What you're seeing there is the balloon being inflated. 
It's held down, so most of the balloon is lying on the ground. Remember, this is happening on the ground at essentially sea level, where you have normal atmospheric pressure. The balloon is going to go up, and uh, it will expand as it goes up where there's less pressure. So there's laying out, getting ready to launch. Here is the launch has just happened. The balloon was being held down here, now it's been released and it's going up. Again, this is the super tiger that did a block there. Got the parachute strapped to the bottom of the balloon. There it's just been lifted off. The balloon is way up above in that picture and the instrument has just been lifted off the end of the crane. The reason it's on a crane which is maneuverable is if there should be a little wind blowing the balloon to the side, you don't want to let go. You want to let go of the package when it's directly below the balloon so it'll just go up. If the balloon is off to the side and you let go, the package might bounce on the ground before it goes up and that's not really good for the electronic instruments. So here is this on the left. You see it just shortly after, la after launch. So that's a picture of the balloon uh, just shortly after launch. Again, most of the balloon is just hanging there limp because, again, we're near, near the ground with atmospheric pressure. But when it's up, it floats. So this is a picture taken uh, with a telescope of a balloon at float. The little white dot underneath it is an instrument, a balloon instrument, uh, the Super Tiger instrument, and you can barely see the parachute connected to the bottom of the balloon. And just to give you a sense of scale, here's a picture. On the left is what the balloon looks like just before launch. It's a 40 million cubic foot, the 40 MCF, 40 million cubic foot balloon. Uh, on the left is what it looks like. It's almost 1,000 feet from the instrument on the ground to the top of the balloon. When it's at, at float, the balloon is almost spherical, and it's uh, 400 and some feet in diameter. Picture a football field. That's the balloon would fill the football field, right? Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, just to give you another sense of scale, the Washington Monument is there, and we can add another familiar site to just give you a sense of the scale of what we're talking about. It's, it's a big thing, uh, but the instrument, the Super Tiger instrument that we're talking about weighs about 2, 000, uh, two tons, 4,000 pounds. So it takes a pretty big balloon to lift it. So this shows the trajectory of our Super Tiger flight that happened, uh, was launched in December 2012 and floated for 55 days. Uh, and the, what you see there are the lines that show the trajectory uh, with dots every day.
where, where it came down was about 1,000 miles from McMurdo. I mean, this Antarctica is a big continent. It was around 1,000 miles from McMurdo. It was February 1. On February 1, people are, most of the people in Antarctica are scrambling to go home because it's beginning to, well, here we are on February 2. Here in St. Louis, you notice the days have been getting longer here. Well, down there in the beginning of February, the days are getting much shorter and uh, colder and so on, and a lot of the crew is going home, and so the instrument was left. We had a satellite picture of the area. Uh, there's a dot on there that's not a picture of the Tiger instrument. It's just a picture of what the area looks like from the satellite. It's the middle of no place. Lots of snow, far from anything. We could not get out there uh, that year. So a year later, we sent a crew down there, and they were able, unfortunately, they weren't able to get to the instrument. There were, uh, in uh, October, November of 20, well, November, December of 2013, there was this uh, government shutdown that shut down a lot of the operations in Antarctica. So even though we had a crew down in Antarctica to recover the instrument, the logistics, there's lots of scientists all over Antarctica picking up meteorites and doing seismo seismology uh, uh, and all sorts of other science. Uh, and the logistics of getting a plane and all, we couldn't get a crew out there. We were able to uh, fly over. There's the instrument. Uh, you notice that what you're looking at is that substructure that was below the instrument as it was assembled. That's all that's above the snow after a year. The instrument landed. Apparently, the parachute dragged it over upside down. And after a year, it was half buried in snow. And that's all we got a year later. Fortunately, most of the data we had, because during the flight, the data was radioed down. It goes up to uh, uh, tracking and data relay satellite system that's over the equator, TDRS satellites, and the data brought down. So most of the, <coughs> of the data we had, and we were analyzing the data and getting ready, uh, even though we didn't have the instrument back. So that was a year after it landed. Two years after it landed, we finally got some people down there. And by that time, it was almost completely buried. Uh, and uh, it turned out initially we could only get one of our crew out there along with some people from the Antarctic uh, station. Uh, and uh, this is Thomas Hams from Goddard who did most of the digging you see, he, he disassembled the soup, the, what was the substructure that was on top and dug around so we could get the instrument back. And uh, so we did get the instrument back. And amazingly, two years of cold storage was not harmful to the instrument. And we're getting ready to fly it again in a couple of years. Most of it, right now what's going on is here and at Goddard Space Flight Center, different components are being tested for use in a future flight. Um, let me just skip this. This is uh, data from that flight in which we measure the charge of some of the heavier nuclei. We've got remarkably good charge resolution to the point where, for example, the cobalt peak, which is a hundred times, the cobalt is a hundred times less abundant than iron, and yet we can see a peak there Similarly, copper is 100 times less abundant than nickel, but we can see that peak. And going up to higher charges, <coughs> we have peaks at all the different charges, uh, all the way up to zirconium. So we're beginning to get good measure of the abundances of these elements. Um, what are we getting out of the abundances of the elements? Um, the, there was already data from another spacecraft that looked at anomal, 
differences between the isotopic composition of some of the elements in the cosmic rays and the isotopic composition of the elements in the Earth and around here that pointed to uh, origin in what are called superbubbles. Uh, and the data that we have from these heavy elements in Super Tiger is really confirming the superbubble origin. The superbubble is you have a region where there are a bunch of massive stars. Massive stars don't last long and they tend to die in a supernova explosion. So this is a region where you have massive stars dying, spewing stuff out into interstellar space, and the expected composition in the region of here of a superbubble is the, is the composition very much like what we are seeing in the cosmic rays. And so what we are confirming is the cosmic rays seem to come from these ascent regions where there's a bunch of massive stars. That's not too surprising, although it's nice to have evidence for it, because superbubbles are where most of the supernovae occur. Supernovae are massive stars that explode explosively, that die explosively. This is the Crab Nebula, a supernova that was observed in the year 1054, and what's left is this surrounding, uh, surrounding bunch of uh, gas that's spewing out, that's moving out from the supernova. And uh, the gas and dust surrounding the supernova are accelerated by shock waves moving out. And that's pretty much the understanding of where cosmic rays come from. And the point is that our evidence with the super tiger is supporting this model of cosmic rays coming from these uh, 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 super bubbles. Um, and by the way, this is just another perspective. So this is a picture, uh, a uh, optical light picture of a distant galaxy that is similar to our galaxy, which is a spiral, spiral form. And uh, in our galaxy, we are somewhere out to the side. I don't know what that's about, but uh, we are out there in, in, the, in the galaxy, in our galaxy, uh, out two-thirds of the way out from the center of the galaxy. And the cosmic rays that we see are coming from a region of uh, several thousand light years around uh, the solar system. Now, before I go on further, I want to stop and ask a question of you. Think about this. Why do we go to all the trouble of going to Antarctica? You can launch balloons like this almost anywhere, and in fact, some are launched. Uh, one of the sites where balloons are launched uh, is uh, Fort Sumner, uh, New Mexico. Uh, why do we go to Antarctica? Does anybody have ideas of why we go to Antarctica? Yes. The magnetic fields, very good. That's one re is that what you were going to say? Pardon me? No, actually more. The point, it, the, the point was that the radiation coming in near the equator gets put away. But by going near the pole, the radiation can just come in un unimpeded. Yeah, no, no. If it tries to come in near the equator, it just gets curved out and goes back out into space, and we never see it on Earth or even in the upper atmosphere. But if it's trying to come in near the pole, it's going along the field lines, and it's not, uh, it's not deflected. So it's easier to get it near the pole, uh, at least some of the cosmic rays. But actually, there's a lot of people who fly balloons that need to get above the atmosphere that are not down at, at, uh, in Antarctica because of the low, magnetic, low deflection of the magnetic field. There are people doing X-ray astronomy or gamma ray, and those you could do anywhere. The magnetic field is of no consequence. 
and yet they still go to Antarctica. Anybody have an idea of why bother going to Antarctica? It does go in a circle, that's right. Over Antarctica at 125,000 feet, it tends to go around in a circle. But, yes, you have no Oh, okay. Somebody else have an idea? Yes. Oh, well, if that's a different, uh, another question, why don't we go to, uh, why don't we go and do it on the north? And you don't need a McMurdo station. We could launch from Fairbanks, Alaska, and it would go very well. The reason for not going to the north is not a physics region. Yes? Well, not a lot of air traffic, and most importantly, if you're going around the North Pole, then you're dealing with a similar orbit around the North Pole. You're dealing with all sorts of international issues. You're flying over Russia. Does Russia want our balloons over them? I don't know. So, but there's another reason for going to Antarctica. You're right, it, it, there's, not, there's no air traffic you gotta worry about. Of course, when the balloons that float, you don't worry about air traffic either. We don't have airplanes going up there. On the way up or on the way down, you have to watch out for it, but that, that can be taken care of. There's another very good reason for, for going to Antarctica. Weather, wind, well, actually, sometimes the weather socks you in for a week and you can't do anything. Yes? No? Rich? Well, no, no, no. There's a very practical reason for flying these balloons there. No, no, no. What, what's going on in Antarctica in January, December and January that's not going on here in December, January? 24 hours of sunlight, you bet. That's good for the operating the solar panels for powering the instrument. You could work with solar panels that work only, uh, that only get power in the day and then you have big batteries storing. But the other thing is these balloons, if you go through, if you go through sunset, the balloon, the helium in the balloon cools and shrinks, and the balloon doesn't have as much buoyancy if it's smaller, and it falls. And if you want to stay up at that altitude, you can go through one or two sunsets dropping some ballast on the way, which can be done by, uh, by radio command. But if you want to stay up for a month, you can't possibly have enough ballast. But if you're flying over, south, over Antarctica, there's no sunset in December, January, and so you don't ever have to worry about the balloon shrinking at nighttime and the balloon falling. And combine that with the, uh, with the uh, uh, winds at float altitude that just circle the pole, <clears throat> and you get a uh, uh, and, and you get a very nice flight, and you saw the trajectory of this Tiger flight. It was up, that was record. More typical is to get about a month of flight, 30 days or so. We got, because of that extra time around, we got almost two months of data. There's another reason for flying over Antarctica for one experiment, and this gets us to the other experiment that I was gonna talk about, ANITA. The the, we're trying to study extremely high energy neutrinos from astrophysical sources, wherever they might be. Now, neutrinos are elementary particles that are almost zero mass, not quite, but almost zero mass. They're not charged, so they do travel in straight lines. They're not affected by any magnetic fields, but they're not affected by almost anything. In fact, they're not affected by almost any detector. It's very hard to detect neutrinos. There are neutrinos from the sun, much lower energy than what we were talking about going through us right now, and they just don't do anything. 
They don't interact with material. They're very hard to detect. So, and at the highest energies, they're very rare. So you need a very large detector, a very large detecting volume, if you want to see these very rare things. And where Tiger was high up because it wanted to be above the atmosphere to see the stuff coming in from above, Anita is high up simply because it wants to get a good view of lots of Antarctic ice. What's happening is uh, what's called the Iskarian effect that was first, uh, uh, Iskarian was a Russian who uh, predicted this back in the 1960s. And the basic idea is if a neutrino interacts in the ice, in the ice it will make a shower of secondary particles uh, they're mostly electrons and positrons, but they turn out to be, you end up with more electrons than positrons, so you have this shower of particles about this big going very nearly the speed of light through the ice. But they're going the speed of light, close to the speed of light in vacuum. The speed of light in ice is lower, so they're going faster than the speed of light in ice. And that results in an effect similar to what happens when an airplane goes faster than the speed of sound. You get a sonic boom. When you get a bunch of charged particles going faster than the speed of light uh, in the medium, then you get uh, a light flash, which is called Cherenkov radiation. And in this case, what you'll get is a flash of radio emission, a very brief a few nanosecond <coughs> pulse of radio emission coming from the cascade. And so what we're doing with the balloon up there at the top of the picture is monitoring a very large area of Antarctic ice, about, uh, about a million square kilometers of ice. Uh, this is another picture of Antarctica. This, the coloring in this picture is showing the depth of the ice. So the, the red areas are where the ice is like four kilometers, uh, a couple miles thick. The uh, yellow is about half of that. The blue is almost no depth of ice. So the idea is you launch a, a balloon So the ANITA instrument is looking down on the ice. It's using the balloon altitude just to get a view of a very large area. Uh, and so you're looking at, in round numbers, a million cubic kilometers of ice. There's another experiment looking at lower energy neutrinos that's been built at the, ice, at the, at the South Pole, which is called the Ice Cube. It's a cubic kilometer of ice that's monitored <coughs> for the result of neutrino interactions, but that's just a cubic kilometer. We're talking about a million cubic kilometers. Yes? Oh, very good. Why ice? The point about ice is it's essentially transparent to these radio pulses. So, uh, I mean, you could do the same thing in any you know, these neutrinos could be interacting in the ground underneath us, but the radio pulse that comes from them isn't going to get through, where the ice is, uh, is not a conductor at all, unlike water. And uh, so the ice, uh, you get this radio pulse and it can get out of the ice. It, it can go through as much as a couple kilometers of ice before it's attenuated. So. Uh, we're looking at about two kilometers deep times a million square kilometers. Um, this is what Anita, the first Anita flight, all those white squares that you see are radio horns. So there, and uh, actually we've had two more Anita flights and it's been outfitted with even more radio horns. 
So these are essentially radio receivers looking out and a little down. So they're looking all the way out to the horizon, which is 400 miles away and down below, looking for pulses of radio coming and hitting them. And by seeing the timing difference between a pulse at the lower ring and the pulse at the upper ring and uh, the relative intensity from nearby antennas, you can actually get a pretty good idea of where it was coming from. And uh, so again, down below, the black squares below are the solar panels for powering the instrument. Uh, that's actually the part of ANITA that we were responsible for at Washington U, the power system. And uh, there it is, ready for launch. Uh, unfortunately, look at the first flight. It left, an a much more typical flight, which where the winds that float take you all around. But here it went within about 50 miles of the South Pole. Why do you suppose we're unhappy getting this thing to go by the South Pole? That's part of it. It's completely avoided the area of the thick ice. Our Super Tiger went nicely over the area of thick ice, but we don't care, we're looking up. <laughs> Anita, which wants to look down at thick ice, didn't go there. There's another reason for avoiding the, North, the South Pole. Or for, by the way, once it's up, it goes where the winds go. There's nothing we can do to direct it. And uh, what's a tr what else is a trouble being near the South Pole? Do you have any idea? You bet, South Pole Station. South Pole is a very active place, particularly in the summer down there. There's lots of people doing a bunch of different kinds of, of science. Uh, a lot of it is uh, astronomical and various other science. And they all have radios, and they all have, and basically it's a source of lots of radio noise. <coughs> and we're looking for radio signals. So time near, near the South Pole uh, at least for the part of our view in the South Pole direction, uh, it might as well turn our instrument off. It's useless. Uh, the next flight was better. Uh, it went, did spend at least some time over the deepest ice, and it nicely avoided the South Pole. And the third flight, oh, after the second flight, oh, I should, let me just go back. After the second flight, you see it came down on the Ross. shelf, which is a nice, convenient place to go out and pick it up. And uh, well, it got pulled, it fell over as it landed. Uh, perhaps the parachute dragged it over, or perhaps it was just coming down at an angle and uh, tipped over. But in fact, it was in pretty good condition, and uh, the pieces could be brought back. And uh, there was a third flight, uh, which this time it went around, and then as you see, it's on the second time around, it started drifting north, that is away from the pole, and if it stayed at that latitude and continued going north, it might very well have ended up in the water, which is not a good place to try to recover the instrument. And so it was brought down there, and most of the, some of the material has been recovered, some of it isn't, it turns out to be, uh, fairly rugged uh, place at about eight or 9,000 feet altitude. And it's, it's not, uh, we've got pieces, it's right near a, uh, an Australian uh, Antarctic base and they've been good enough to go out and bring back some of the instrument, the really expensive electronics, but a lot of, all those horns are still out there in the snow. So <clears throat> results to date. No neutrinos detected. We've had three of these flights, and what that really means, uh, the, it sets an upper limit on the flux of these astrophysically orienting neutr uh, arriving neutrinos, 
and constrains some of the theories of where they could be coming from, what processes could be producing them. But it's not quite what we're looking for. On the other hand, we got a surprise, uh, and there's a bit of a story there that I, I don't really have time to tell now, but it turns out Anita can detect extremely high energy cosmic rays that produce showers in the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, we are detecting those, and it's, uh, it's comparable to the sensitivity of some large arrays on the ground for detecting extremely high energy cosmic rays. So that's where we are. What's coming up for our high energy astrophysics at Washington U is we're involved in preparing for this coming December, a launch of ANITA at, in Antarctica. In December of 2017, a launch of Super Tiger, the second flight of Super Tiger. Again, th these particles are rare, and we'd like to go up heavier than charge 40, which are even rarer. We just have to accumulate more time, uh, large area, long time. Uh, and then in 2018, uh, my colleague uh, Henrik Krasinski, uh, who's also in the physics department at Wash U, is building, along with some people at Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, Excalibur, which is looking at X-rays and the polarization of X-rays. It's a very, <coughs> excuse me, very sophisticated experiment that he is building, and that's uh, coming up in a few years, hopefully. So that's almost the end, but I do have to acknowledge that it's not only the Academy of Science that invited me here, but we have as a host institution the zoo. So I have to show you some animals. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'd be glad to take any questions that people have. Sir. Okay, how do they become charged, uh, the cosmic rays, and what do we learn by studying them? How they become charged, basically, or an ordinary atom has a positively charged nucleus and a cloud of electrons around it. And basically, the shock wave from the supernovae hits an ordinary atom and effectively ionizes it, just gives the nucleus a kick, and it kicks away the electrons, is the best I can say. It gets ionized, and so you have a bare nucleus left going at a very high speed. Some of the electrons also get accelerated, but it turns out the bare nucleus, we get in a lot more of the bare nuclei accelerated. Now, what do we learn? On the one case, we learn by seeing which elements, and not only which elements, but another instrument that we're involved in that's on a spacecraft about a million miles from here, uh, is measuring not just which element, but which isotope that is, the elements are given by how many protons are in the nucleus, what the charge is. The isotope is how many neutrons are added. So, for example, iron is mostly iron 56, which is 26 protons and 30 uh, neutrons. But there's also iron 54. Uh, some of the isotopes are radioactive, and we learn things about the time it takes these particles to, from when they're produced to when they get here by looking, using the radioactive isotopes as clocks. As far as the heavy nuclei, the other whole thing is all of the atoms heavier than helium that, that are around us, that are part of us, the oxygen, the calcium, the carbon, are all made in stellar processes. The Big Bang at the beginning of the universe left us with hydrogen and helium and nothing else, actually a tiny bit of lithium. Uh, 
All of the heavier elements, all of the heavier elements are made in stellar processes. And we learn and infer things about these stellar processes by looking at the relative abundances of elements here on Earth. The cosmic rays give us relative abundances of a different set of elements, similar but not the same, and that gives us a better understanding of these nuclear processes that make the heavier elements. And so the poetic way of saying it is, we are stardust. Uh, you've probably heard that, that's not original with me. Uh, but uh, the cosmic rays are a look at a different set of stardust with a somewhat different composition and helps us understand better what the, uh, test some of the models of the production of these elements. A question back in the back row. Yes. Oh, what are the funding sources and what does it cost? That's a good question. All of our research is funded by NASA, uh, National Air, uh, you know, Air and Space, whatever it's called. NASA. <laughs> NASA funds all of our, all of our research. Uh, the cost of one of these is several million dollars for building the instrument, and that's a lot of manpower. I mean, these aren't things that you go to the store and buy. We build them in our lab and the lab at Goddard. And so we're talking about manpower and, and uh, hardware. So it's, it's uh, I don't know, $5 million so to, for the total, which is very cheap compared to putting a similar instrument on a spacecraft where the launch, I mean, the launch is much rougher. It's a different order of magnitude of what you have to do to build it and test it before launching on, uh, getting it up on a spacecraft. So there you're talking about many tens of millions or a few hundred million depending what you're talking about. So balloon, ballooning has a big advantage because it's, I know several million dollars doesn't sound like cheap, but it's cheap uh, on, on the scale of what NASA, uh, NASA experiments will do. And it's very cheap compared to manned missions in space. Uh, yeah, a question right there. Yeah, it, it, well, uh, no, that's a very good question. What happens is uh, the interaction produces secondary particles. It produces some gamma rays. The gamma rays going through the material do what's called pair production, an equal number of electrons and positrons. So to first order, what you have is a pulse uh, which is overall charge neutral because it produces lots. If it's a very high energy product, uh, process, you get a very large number of positrons and electrons. We're talking about for the cosmic, ray, the neutrinos that we're looking for are things like 10 to the 19 electron volts. And typically, therefore, you're going to be talking about 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 electrons and positrons. Now, the what Ascarian did is point out that there are two things that are going to make it unevenly charged. One is that some of the positrons run into electrons in the material as they're going through, and an electron and a positron getting close together annihilate. The, a positron is an anti-electron. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is, pardon me? It's electrically neutral, but it's no longer in the shower. It's, and so what's left, so you annihilate a positron with a ambient electron that's just been sitting around in the material. And the result is the positron is no longer in this rapidly moving shower. The other thing that happens is, in addition to gamma rays pair producing, if a gamma ray hits an atom, it can 
produce a knock, it can essentially ionize and add, a, make a high energy electron. So both of those things give it what Ascarian calculated was something like a 20% excess of negative versus positive. And so then you have this bunch of material that's about that big, a bunch of electrons and positrons, but more electron than positron, so there's a net negative charge, and this bunch is moving through the ice at very close to the speed of light in the vacuum, which is faster than the speed of light in the material, and uh, the, the electrons will radiate coherently at, as long as you're dealing with wavelengths large compared to the size of this clump, which is about this big. And so we're looking at pulses of uh, hundreds of megahertz or gigahertz pulses. Uh, there was a question over here. Oh, why about what's interesting in high energy neutrinos? Neutrinos, because, well, one of the things is neutrinos, so why, why bother detecting these high energy neutrinos? N neutrinos, because they don't interact with almost anything, they penetrate anything. And so where the light or the gamma rays coming to us can come from stars at quite some distance, the neutrinos can come from anywhere in the universe. There's nothing that will stop 99% or more of the neutrinos that are produced, no matter how far away they can get here. So it's a probe that, at least in principle, can probe the entire universe. And so we can see neutrinos from anywhere. If only we could see them. <laughs> they could get here from anywhere, and if we could finally detect them, then uh, we could be looking at objects that are far away, that are in, the, in a dense cloud of material that, that uh, blocks us from seeing the light, and so on. So that, that's the, the fun of neutrinos. Uh, the, the same thing that makes them hard to detect also makes them penetrating very, very long distances through almost anything. So the whole universe is transparent to neutrinos. Other? Yes, sir. Yeah, what can we say about the, the fact that the system can detect the direction of the cosmic rays? The system, the Tiger system, can detect the direction that the cosmic ray entered our instrument. The problem is that doesn't tell us anything about where they came from because it could have come from over there and there's these magnetic fields in the galaxy between the stars that can deflect it and others that can deflect it. So it could come into our instrument from here but that doesn't mean it came from that star. It could have come from that star and been deflected. And these interstellar magnetic fields are very tangled. We don't know exactly where they are or what their strength and what their direction is, so there's no way we can go back. The only reason we want to detect the direction coming into the instrument is to compensate for the fact that if you have a flat detector like we do, if an instrument goes, if a cosmic ray comes straight through, it sees that thickness of material. If it comes through at an angle, it goes through more material, gives off a brighter pulse of light. But that brighter pulse has nothing to do with the charge of the particle, it just went through more material. So we've got to know the trajectory in order to correct for instrumental effects. But knowing which way it came from when it entered our instrument, unfortunately, tells us absolutely nothing about where in the sky it came from. These charged particles are affected by magnetic fields. 
Let's see, way in the back, and then there's another gentleman here, but let's start. Yes, yes sir. No, that's, that's, that's a good question. We, we've ionized the material and what happens to the uh, orphan electrons. Um, some of them also get accelerated. So in the cosmic rays, uh, you can see electrons. Uh, there are fewer electrons. And so the ones that don't get accelerated, they're just there. I mean, it's the number of atoms that get stripped and accelerated is a tiny, tiny fraction of the number that are there. So a few extra electrons here and there, no one's going to know what to do with them. There was a question over here, sir. Ah, uh, failure ratios of these machines. Um, Let's see, what, uh, what can I say? Uh, nothing is perfect. The instrument is designed for what we like to call graceful degradation. So the instrument, as you saw, has lots of these photomultipliers. And if a few of them fail, as did happen in flight, that decreases our sensitivity a little bit. It means a little part of the area is not sensitive but uh, doesn't uh, overall hurt the instrument. So we design it, like I say, graceful degradation. In fact, part of the reason that this was built is that you saw two separate, essentially independent instruments next to each other. In the worst case, if somehow one of those two died completely, we would still have half an instrument up there. Now it didn't, and, and we're not rooting for it. We don't want that. Uh, so a lot of what goes into failures is um, one uh, tries to avoid it by doing lots of testing before the flight. Well, fail safes if you can, and there are backup things and redundancy. Uh, you're, you're quite right. Uh, you you want to build in some fail safes, and in in the case of the Tiger instrument. It's, it's mainly this uh, redundancy. And, uh, and it's similarly true in Anita. If some of the horns are dead, or not just the horn, but the electronic system that uh, takes the feed, um, it decreases the sensitivity without killing the instrument. There are a few places that could kill the instrument. If the power, there are things about the power system where you have some redundancy, but it's impossible to have no single point failures, although we've got very few. Uh, yes, sir. Uh -huh. Good question. Um, basically, with both Anita and Tiger, uh, the particle accelerators that one has can simulate what we're looking for. And so, in fact, parts of the, of the ANITA instrument were taken to the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And uh, I'm sorry, the question, I'm supposed to repeat the question. The question was, how, if we haven't seen any neutrinos, how do you know the detector is capable of detecting neutrinos? And the answer has to do with we have shot not exactly neutrinos, but showers of electrons into enormous blocks of ice at the uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator and detected the radio pulses that were predicted uh, from those. So that was a test there. In the case of uh, charged particle detectors, high energy charge and high charge charge particle detectors. We do have instruments that we have taken to um, CERN. CERN is the big uh, particle accelerator in Geneva, or just outside of Geneva, on the, actually on the Swiss-French border. 
and we have used, they sometimes, they're usually accelerating just protons, but they do sometimes accelerate heavy nuclei, and we have calibrated some of our instruments using the heavy nuclei beams at the CERN uh, particle accelerator. Okay, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your being here and your good questioning. Thank you.